In this video, we'll talk about section 2.8, photography. So photography is derived from the Greek phos, meaning light, and graphos, meaning writing, so writing with light. Now, something called a camera obscura was used by artists since about 500 CE to sort of accurately help them copy nature. So the word camera in Latin is the word for room. So originally, these would have been portable tents or rooms with a small hole um, called an aperture in one side. And as light enters that hole, it inverts and projects the outside scene onto the opposite wall. Um, so really, it works just like your eye works. By the second half of the 16th century, um, we had figured out how to condense this concept. Um, artists realized they did not have to be inside the box or room, and that if they added a lens to the aperture, it could improve the clarity of the image, and an angled mirror inside the camera obscura would reverse the image and project it out right side up. Um, so these were really helpful for capturing the precise details of a scene as they truly are. However, these projections are not permanent. They had to be traced or drawn by hand. So true photography could not exist until images could be fixed, which is really a chemical process. In 1826, the French inventor and chemist Joseph Nesfor Niepce um, used a specially coated pewter plate in his camera obscura. And he recorded the view from his window after an eight hour exposure. He called this a heliograph, and really it's the first permanent photograph. Um, it's on display at um, UT Dallas, I believe, um, if you ever are down that way. But Niepce then went on to work with his fellow Frenchman, Louis Jacques Mondé Daguerre. Um, Daguerre was a stage designer and painter, so he had lots of experience using a camera obscura. Um, and he worked with Niepce until his death in 1833. Together, they invented a method of fixing an image on a polished metal plate. They used a copper plate coated with silver iodide to make it light sensitive. Um, they had this idea because it's silver turns dark when exposed to light, it oxidizes, right? Um, so they put the plate in the camera and opened the shutter for about 20 to 30 minutes to expose it to sunlight and record the image. Mercury vapors reveal the positive image, and then it is chemically fixed to the paper with table salt, um, or it was at that time at least. So we're looking at an example. This is a photo taken by Daguerre, his, the artist studio from 1837. Um, so this is sort of a still life composition, a collection of objects in Daguerre's studio. So at first, exposure times for these photos were so long that they could really only record stationary objects. Um, the result is a highly detailed um, image, but it has a sort of reflective surface. Um, really, these are pretty as objects themselves, um, but not the best um, photographic reproduction. Um, it is a positive image, though, not a negative, um, but it could not be reproduced without taking another photo. So these are um, one-offs, really. This is Daguerre's Le Boulevard du Tempel from 1838. Um, so we have a busy street, but it appears deserted. Why might that be? Um, seems to be the middle of the day, and if it's usually very busy and bustling, um, what's going on? Well, um, outdoors in full daylight like this, the exposure time of a photograph would have still been about eight to ten minutes, which is too long to capture people or other moving things. Um, things that were moving didn't make a lasting impression on the plate. So it's not that the street was actually deserted, but rather um, the things in the street, the people, the, um, the animals, whatever, they were moving and therefore they were not recorded in the impression. The only person captured is one man and he's right here, and he's actually having his shoes shine. So potentially it's possible that he just happened to be sitting there having his shoes shine for the duration of the exposure time, but it was probably um, posed or staged. But either way, this is the very first photo um, of a person. Um, purposefully, I suppose. 
Um, so Daguerre patented his process in 1839 and announced his discoveries to the world. And shortly thereafter, an American inventor named Samuel Finley Bruce Morris traveled to France to trade his information on the telegraph um, with Daguerre for his information about the um, camera and the photograph. By 1841, Morse had figured out to um, reduce the exposure time to about a minute, um, so therefore they could reasonably photograph people. And so daguerreotypes, which is what Daguerre named um, his photograph, um, these became quite popular for portraits. Um, they were much more accessible than portrait painting. But daguerreotypes are still quite fragile. Um, they are high quality and can produce high levels of detail, but again, they have this sort of shiny surface which distorts the image, um, and it only produces a single positive image. Um, so again, a one-off. Now around this same time, the Englishman Henry Fox Talbot invented calotypes, which are sort of negative photo drawings using paper coated with a light sensitive material. He discovered that he could um, capture an image this way and then redo the process using the negative as his subject and therefore create a positive image. So this is really the first negative to positive that we see. Um, and so the calotype negative could produce multiple positive copies, but it produced a softer, sort of fuzzier um, image than the daguerreotype, although with no shiny surface. Here is Talbot's The Open Door from 1843. Um, we have the medium of calotype really being pushed into the realm of artwork here. Um, Talbot is sort of exploring the artistic and aesthetic qualities of the medium rather than its documentary qualities, considering that it's a softer, fuzzier image. Um, we have these shadows that create patterns of diagonal lines that sort of contrast with the rectilinear architecture here. Um, and this composition becomes somewhat of a commentary on industrialization or maybe nostalgia for the rural or quiet life that is sort of going extinct or beginning to go extinct around this time period. Um, you can really get a sense of the soft lines of a calotype within this photo. Um, initially, the daguerreotype was much more widespread than the calotype, but we really owe a lot to this concept because it later leads us to um, the process of using negatives with plastic film um, for photography. Some inventors, such as Frederick Scott Archer, um, sought to combine the detail of the daguerreotype with the reproducibility of the calotype. In 1850 and 51, he invented what's called the collodion or wet plate process, which is essentially um, black and white darkroom photography. Um, this is pretty cumbersome. It requires a lot of equipment and chemistry. Um, it requires liquid. It has to be wet in order to be light sensitive, but it records a very nice crisp image on glass. Um, so these collodion negatives um, had many uses, including making photographic prints on paper. Um, and this is a popular process, or it was rather until, um, well, it's still in use by some today, but it's a little outdated um, at this point. So with the invention of photography, portrait painters began to see a decrease in their market. Um, photographs were much more accessible, they were less time consuming to create and to sit for, um, and they were much cheaper. Um, here we have a work by the French photographer Nader. Um, he made a collodion negative slash albumin print. Um, he did portraits of several well-known artists, writers, politicians, etc. Um, here we see an actress by the name of Sarah Bernhardt from 1865. Um, Nader is very conscious with his posing, you know, using elaborate props and lush fabric, um, which is pretty common for portrait photography at the time. Um, the exposure time was still about a minute here, so it did require um, sort of concentration, I suppose, on the sitter's part in order to um, be still and such. But um, the artist here is really trying to get a sense of maybe elegance, but also the introspective aspects of the actress's personality, I think. 
Now, this is not portrait photography, but it's interesting. Um, Nader was also known for photographing from a hot air balloon and um, capturing what are really the first aerial photos. Julia Margaret Cameron was a British photographer and one of the first great portrait photographers. Um, she pioneered the use of close-ups and controlled lighting to enhance the images of her subjects. She intentionally avoided the sharp focus that most photographers sought out. Um, she believed photography could show not only what was visible, but the allegorical, poetic, and intuitive aspects of life used um, Excuse me, she used special lenses and long exposure times to create what's called a soft focus look. Um, for example, on the right side, we have um, the example from your book, Angel of the Nativity from 1872. Um, very soft and really transforming this young girl, who was her niece, I believe, um, into almost a cherub, a little Cupid like um, figure as a as would be seen in maybe a Renaissance painting. So sort of soft, elegant, uh, almost romantic in a way. From the beginning, photography has served a documentary function as well. Um, it makes it possible to record and preserve important events and people. Um, and really only a few decades after the invention of the medium, photographers had begun to bring public attention to the suffering caused by war, hunger, poverty, etc. This new tool made visual statements believable in a way that no other medium could, and it made it possible to bring about a sort of empathetic awareness that might lead to a social reform. Um, so here we have Roger Fenton's The Valley of the Shadow of Death from 1855. Um, this is a photograph of a battlefield um, during the Crimean War. And really, this is the first historic attempt to portray war with photography. Um, so this is after the battle. You can see all of the cannonballs here. Um, and then the title alludes to Psalms 23 in the Christian Bible um, in the Valley of the Shadow of Death. So sort of implying that in this photo, we only have a shadow of what actually occurred. Timothy O'Sullivan was an American photographer. He began working as an apprentice in Matthew Brady's daguerreotype studio in New York City. Um, in this studio, the assistants did all of the work, the photographing, the developing, and everything. Um, but Brady got all of the credit. Um, this studio commonly um, photographed the Civil War. But eventually, O'Sullivan left Brady's studio so that he could get proper credit as um, the artist. So his photographs really gave American citizens new access to the death and carnage of war. Allegedly, O'Sullivan would photograph during battles. Um, and allegedly, two times, his camera was hit by um, shell fragments. So this photo is titled A Harvest of the Dead. Um, it's from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in July of 1863. So we have the Confederate dead at Gettysburg. Um, this really goes beyond traditional images of war, which usually consist of armies at rest, um, kind of during the off time. Um, instead, capturing the grim and gruesome reality of war. Now, O'Sullivan and his fellow photographers under Matthew Brady had often staged their photos, not out of a sense of deceit, but more so in order to heighten the dramatic or emotional effect. We don't really know if he's done that here. Um, we do know that he's kind of lowered the camera angle to raise the horizon line a bit in the composition. Um, but we don't really know if he arranged any of the um, corpses or the clothing and things in order to heighten the emotional impact of the scene. Alexander Gardner was a Scottish immigrant who came to the United States in 1856. He also worked in Brady's studio and also left uh, to gain more recognition. Um, I believe he worked with Timothy O'Sullivan quite a bit after they both left the studio. But again, here he is showing the carnage of war as never before seen. So this is his home of the rebel sharpshooter, Battlefield of Gettysburg, 1863. Um, so it's sort of believed that this soldier um, died elsewhere on the battlefield and that Gardner and his um, assistants moved him and set this up um, to create a more artistic or dramatic scene. 
Um, this rocky outcropping was actually in the middle of the battlefield in sort of a low spot, so it would not have been a great spot for a sniper to set up shop. Um, but we're not exactly sure what is real or what is manipulated. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that the gun was a prop carried by um, Gardner and his assistants and just kind of put in the scene again to heighten the um, drama. We tend to assume that photography is real in a way that other visual art like painting is not. Um, and it really can be, but it's not always necessarily. It can also be biased. Um, and while that may be something that concerns us, um, that was not a concern for viewers in the 19th century. They understood that photographs came with bias. So I mentioned the use of photography as an agent of social change. Um, and one of the biggest ways to do that was through photojournalism. Um, so different photographers um, went around and photographed various things and published these photos in order to raise awareness or bring about change. Um, this is a work by Jacob Rees. This is five cents a spot from the late 19th century. Um, Reese photographed the squalid living and working conditions in the poor areas of New York City and published them for the world to see. Um, the result actually was stricter housing codes and improved work safety laws. So this photo was actually made possible by the more recent innovation of the flash photography. So Reese could take the camera into places that were previously uncapturable because of the darkness now that he had that flash bulb. Um, Lewis Wicks Hine used photography to expose the injustice of child labor in the early 1900s. Um, he went to factories and mines, and in 1908, he became the photographer for the National Child Labor Committee. Now, this is kind of a dangerous gig. He was frequently threatened by factory police and foremen. Sometimes he would go in the guise of um, a salesman, a repairman, maybe a safety investigator. But once he was inside, he took photographs and detailed notes about the ages of the children who were working. Um, this helped to initiate child labor laws. So this one, a 10-year-old spinner, he, um, he took a lot of photos in cotton mills. Um, here is little Lottie, a regular oyster shucker in Alabama Canning Company from 1911. And here's child laborers in glassworks, um, which would have been very dangerous conditions. All of these factory conditions would have been quite dangerous, um, in fact. So um, his photographs really set child labor laws into motion. Dorothea Lang was a photographer for the Federal Farm Security Administration and the Resettlement Agency. Um, they commissioned photographers to go around the country and document the effects of the Great Depression and build support for the federal assistance programs in rural areas. Um, Lang documented the plight of migrant farm laborers who had fled um, from the Great Plains and the Dust Bowl and crowded in California looking for work. Um, so this particular photograph is titled Migrant Mother of 1936. Um, Lang said that she didn't ask the name of the woman when she photographed her, but later she was identified as Florence Owens Thomas, the 32-year-old mother of seven. Um, she and her children had come to California to harvest the pea crop on this farm, but when they arrived, it had frozen, um, and so they were stranded there, living on frozen vegetables and um, birds that the children managed to catch. Um, and Upon the time of taking this photograph, um, Thompson had just sold the tires off of her car in order to buy food for her children. Um, the photo was published without any identity, which has caused some controversy. Um, is it okay to publish a photo of someone without their consent or without identifying them? Um, and though aid came to this farm soon after the photo was published, um, so it did result in, you know, affirmative action, but I think this family had already moved on. Um, there is also a bit of manipulation here. So Lang actually retouched the negative to prop out the mother's hand um, resting on a tent pole. 
Steve McCurry is a photographer whose career was launched when he dressed in native clothing and crossed the Pakistan border into rebel-controlled areas of Afghanistan just before the Soviet invasion. Um, when he emerged, he had rolls of film sewn into his clothes, um, and those images were published around the world and were among the first to really show the truth of the conflict in Afghanistan. Um, McCurry took his most recognized portrait, Afghan girl, in a refugee camp near Peshawar, Pakistan. The image itself was named as the most recognizable photograph in the history of the National Geographic magazine. Um, and her face actually became the famous um, cover on the issue of June 1985. Now, this photo has been widely used on Amnesty International brochures, posters, calendars, um, the identity of the Afghan girl remained unknown for over 17 years until McCurry and a National Geographic team located the woman, um, Shabat Gula, in 2002. McCurry said, her skin is weathered, there are wrinkles now, but she is as striking as she was all those years ago. In the 19th century, the art critic John Ruskin argued that a photograph is not a work of art. Um, and the public, in general, was sort of reluctant to accept photos as works of art because of the reliance on a mechanical device. So what do you think about this? Do you agree? Um, is it somehow easier or um, less significant than a painting in terms of art or aesthetics? Um, I think at this point in time in the modern era, um, it's a bit confusing as to why people assumed that the reliance on technology or a mechanical device meant that it was not art, um, whereas now we know that's not the case. Right? We have many different um, forms of digital art making, so it's a bit different now. But at the time that photography was first becoming popular, it was it was difficult for a photographer to break into sort of the um, art world. So here we have a work by Swedish artist Oscar Gustav Rylander. Um, this is titled Two Ways of Life. It's from 1857. Um, and he's really trying to move the medium of photography into the realm of art. Um, Rylander worked in a very labor intensive, time consuming fashion, just like traditional artists um, would have. This is a print. It's 16 by 31 inches, but it's created with 30 plus separate negatives, which Rylander cut out and sort of arranged like puzzle pieces. And he exposed the negatives one at a time, covering the rest of the print from the light. So the result is the appearance of one seamless scene. Um, this took him something like six weeks to create. Um, do you notice anything about the composition that is familiar? I think we definitely have some allusions to Raphael's School of Athens here. Um, Near the middle um, of the work, we have these two youths on either side of an older man. Um, so two youngsters being offered guidance by the patriarch here, um, each of the young ones looking off to a different section of the stage. Um, one of them is being shown virtuous pleasures, while the other is being shown sinful pleasures. So um, we have the two ways or the two paths um, of life that they are being presented with here. Now, the partial nudity that was featured here was deemed pretty indecent by some, but um, Queen Victoria ordered a copy of this for herself and people stopped complaining. So, Alfred Stieglitz was an American photographer. He was an important early proponent of modern art and of photography as fine art. Um, so here we have two photos by Stieglitz. On the left, we have the Flatiron Building from 1903. Um, you can see he's paying attention to the value and atmosphere, as well as to um, the element of line. We have this sort of romantic, poetic image of the urban streets of New York. Um, he's kind of suffused the scene with a misty, wintry atmosphere by manipulating the viewpoint. Um, and perhaps by editing the negatives and prints themselves, but he, his claim to fame is sort of what's called straight photography, meaning that it was produced with no technical manipulation of the negative. Um, I don't know if that applies to the Flatiron building in particular, but for the most part, any um, 
quote unquote editing that might have taken place um, was done in the positioning of the camera and kind of dealing with light and shadow and things like that. No changes to the negative were made um, usually. On the right side, we have spring showers again in New York. This one's from 1901, really showing um, tonal variation and control with these subtle gradations. Um, we have the wet street, looks kind of different from the sidewalk and from the misty sky, but um, really almost difficult to pick out details here, but creates almost a mysterious, and again, sort of romantic or poetic image of urban life. Here we have the steerage from 1907. Um, so this one, we do know um, there was no technical manipulation involved. Um, the artist simply chose what was in the frame, and that's what art is, right? Uh, making decisions about what is included in the composition and how it is included. Um, so Stieglitz here was not necessarily interested in the figures themselves or the subject, um, but more so the spatial relationships between forms, um, kind of the composition of shapes and the rhythms created. Um, Stieglitz also had a gallery, um, 291 Fifth Avenue. The gallery was called 291. Um, and it's very important to modern art and to photography as art. Um, and he also edited a magazine called Camera Work. The French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson was interested in capturing what he called the moment. Um, he was the master of candid photography um, and an early user of 35 millimeter film. He coined the term the decisive moment and that has really been inspiring generations of photographers ever since. Um, here we have Gary Winogren's Central Park Zoo, New York City, 1967. Um, so along the same lines as Bresson, Winogrand was interested in the photograph's ability to capture fleeting moments in time directly. Um, he used a small portable camera and generally didn't pose or set up any of his shots. Um, we have sort of a snapshot aesthetic here, kind of spontaneous and casual, but they're also serious and artistic and he intentionally leaves room for um, the viewer to interpret the subject and kind of ask themselves, what's going on here? Ansel Adams was a beloved American photographer, and he's really a nice bridge between photography um, as social change and photography as art or aesthetic. Um, Adams was an environmentalist. He wanted to preserve America's wilderness, and he used his photos to increase public awareness for the need of conservation. Adams viewed aspects of nature as symbols of spiritual life, capable of transcending the conflicts of society in his majestic and black and white photographs. Um, so here we have his sand dune sunrise, Death Valley National Monument, California, from about 1948. Um, he's really managed to capture a range of black, white, and gray tones to create this balanced effect. Um, and in a way, this is almost um, almost an abstract composition or bordering on it, I would say. Here's another, this one from 1942, the Tetons and the Snake River. Got these varying textures in sort of the um, brushy foliage or scrub grass. Um, the rock, the mountains and snow in the background, the clouds, and this nice smooth river that sort of runs throughout to pull the viewer back through the composition. Um, really nice contrasts, both in texture and sort of in value as well. Um, Ansel Adams, Crystal Bridges did an exhibition of Adams photos mm, two years ago now. Um, it was really fantastic if you happen to have the chance to see it, but um, if you ever have the chance to see an Adams exhibition, it's, it's totally worth it. Digital photography first became available in about 1985, um, and it really marked a huge shift in the medium. By 2000, cameras were being integrated into phones. Um, with digital photography, images are recorded as pixels instead of on film, um, so the process is slightly different. Um, but photos are still used um, in many of the same ways that they've always been used um, as documentary pieces, as artworks, um, various things. So here we have Edward Bertinsky's um, 
manufacturing number 17, data chicken processing plants. Um, so Bratinsky prints large scale color photos that emphasize the vast scale of urban landscapes and also the relative smallness of humanity. Um, this particular photo comes from his China series, which focuses on factories that are driven by mass consumerism and turn raw or recycled materials into consumer goods to ship worldwide. Um, so here we have workers inside an industrial plant, um, specifically a chicken processing plant. Um, and then sort of speaking to the prominence of human consumption of chicken worldwide, I believe it's the most commonly consumed bird um, in every country. Um, we have this nice contrast between the black and white uh, kind of dark, grimy factory setting and these bright pink suits or um, sort of ponchos that the workers are wearing and their white boots and pants um, sort of creates this almost surreal attention grabbing scene and it really makes you think what's this trying to say to me? Um, so we'll end our photography discussion here but we will look at several other examples of photography when we look at um, our themes and contexts and meanings sections um, in weeks three and four.